So thank you, thank you enough for, for the invitation. Um, I'm glad to be here uh, today. It's, it's very rare to have actually a theme for talk. Um, and when, when you told me about depth, I was like, well, that's the one. <laughs> so it's a challenge, right? Because talking about depth is something special for me, at least, and I hope I'll you know, pass this to you. Um, but I, I actually looked at the definition, right? We all have our own definition of depth. Um, but for me, I took really two part of it. Um, well, the state of having serious qualities or the ability to think seriously about something and the fact of a feeling state of characteristic being strong, extreme or detailed. And you're going to see like what's, what's very interesting is this word is really resonating in many different um, level of my path, but also <coughs> the people I work with. So you can... So I'll, the challenge was, yeah, talking about my past, talking about the startup I, I have founded four years ago, so I will kind of walk you through this. Um, but very first, the choice of the art industry. So I'm from France, as you can be hearing it. <laughs> my accent is pretty strong. Um, and I, you know, I did a business school. Um, and before that, in France, you kind of do a... a crazy studies of two years where you just work like crazy before entering a business school where it sounds like it's vacation. Um, but arriving in the business school, I was like, I am so bored here. I do not want to do marketing for L'Oréal or you know, finance. And I almost quitted and I had my mom on the phone um, and she told me, look, like, you always love the arts. Like since you, I don't know, 10, 11, you actually create stuff, you love museums. Like, why don't you look into the art industry? Why don't you look, you know, for a purpose in this? And I think, like, in terms of depth, right, like, for me, the art is, is all about that. Um, that's everything that has been interesting me, working with artists. Um, how, how, how is it so in, important for me is, I think these are, you know, probably the only profession, and I don't think it's even a profession because you're probably born an artist, um, is to kind of reflect the contemporary world we are in, uh, in depth, and really give an opinion, put the finger where it hurts. You'll see I've worked with specific one, one Portuguese artist um, you know, for the past 10 years, and I'm going to tell you a bit more about his work, but basically that's, that's for me the, the really the thing. I really chose that industry because it's an industry that is in that specific concept. Um, that can shake up the world, that can, you know, make you question things. So, of course, the aesthetic layers is one thing, but, you know, always look behind, always look for, you know, what actually the artist wants to pass you. And I wouldn't do nothing else than working in that industry, I think, if that industry still wants me, you know. <laughs> so my mom did that to me, and she, she told me, look, look, look in the art industry, um, she even went further, is that she actually looked online because I was telling her, come on, I'm doing a business school. Never, no one's going to take me in the arts, right? For me, it was not related. And she found that woman, which is Magda Dennis. Um, she's a French gallerist, and she has done a business school. So she told me, send her CV to that, send her CV to that lady. And I did, and she took me as an internship, um, you know, summer internship, first year of business school. But then you have a gap year, and she told me, look, I'm opening a gallery in Shanghai. If you want to go and direct it, I was like 21, and I was like, OK. <laughs> and I moved to Shanghai for my gap year for one year, and I loved it. And I came back to France, to Canada. I finished my studies, and she hired me back in, in Shanghai. So this was really an incredible experience uh, with her. We worked with, you know, of course, Chinese artists, but as well, like, foreigners coming, staying in artist residencies, and you can go. And this is where I met that person, <laughs> Vils. Uh, his name is Alexandre Rifart. Um, so he's, he's, very known, uh, he's very known in Portugal, but he's known over the world. Uh, and I would say he's one of the top five urban artists uh, in the world. Um, and he's very known for carving portraits on the walls of the city, but he has many different other type of works. So, Vils comes to Shanghai uh, for a month and a half, and I was taking, in, taking care of the, the residency, was there, so sourcing the walls, sourcing the, 
the, everything to do the show. And, um, well, he proposed me to come and direct his studio, so I decided to move to Portugal. Uh, and, um, and together, you can go, we also decided that it was a good idea, in addition of directing the studio, to launch uh, a project. So here I wrote galleries, but it's Underdogs, uh, which is gallery editions and public art. And Underdogs was really like, uh, well, he, he had amazing connection with the municipality of Lisbon. Uh, I was directing a gallery before, so we kind of brainstormed together and decided that uh, this would be the project we would do. And um, here, the, the idea, and I think that goes in the depths of, you know, um, communicating the art, is, was to really choose kind of a triangle of public. So, of course, a gallery, you talk to collectors, public art to talk to every single person walking in the street. And editions, it's for people who do not necessarily have the means to afford unique works of art, but who can still and still want to collect, still want to support the artist. Uh, and so that's what we did, and this has been 10 years already. And then, uh, because that wasn't enough, and I decided that I didn't want it to work for Vils anymore, um, I had a collector in Hong Kong that called me and asked um, if I wanted to come and be the director of development of a private art foundation he was launching. So I did fundraising for three years. So I was back and forth between Lisbon and Hong Kong uh, because I kept underdogs, though. And leaving Hong Kong, um, you know, I kind of seen really different, um, you know, the different key players, let's say the different eyes in the art world, the artists, the collector, the institutions the gallery, um, and I always wanted to kind of create my own thing. Um, and, uh, and I decided to come back to Lisbon for it. And again, like I think Debs is, is very important in, in what I'm doing with what the team is doing. You can go, yeah. And this is Artpool. Um, you can go ahead. So the story of Artpool. Um, very first, what we did uh, is uh, we decided to build a social network for art curators. So the art curators goes in one of those definitions. It's, it's really someone that's going to be, you know, creating that relationship with the artist of dialogue, of really understanding in depth their work to be able to, you know, put words on it, um, do the scenography when you go to a museum, for example. But it's someone that kind of challenged the artist, right? It, as it's a dialogue, it's a ping pong of ideas. Um, and, and well, I've been a curator at Underdogs from, from the start. I also curated shows, so I, I knew more or less the, um, you know, the challenges of curators. This is artful. So the first step was really this, was to build up this social network. So what we did is with my team for the past four years, um, we contacted curators. So it's, it's only professional curators working on a day-to-day -day basis with institutions, galleries, and so on. And, um, and we contacted them. We, well, we selected them on very basic criteria. Um, we had a lot of peer-to-peer -peer recommendation, uh, a lot of people applying, and we would really review if this was a real professional curator. And we built up the social network. The idea was to, it's kind of a LinkedIn, but very specific to the art world and very specific to curators. So they have their profile, you know where they are coming from, they can create posts, uh, they can add the curatorial text they have, uh, wrote for the exhibition, images, videos, everything. They can share it, they can, you have the network button where curators can see uh, everyone on the platform. And now we have more than 900 curators from more than 75 countries in the world. So it's, it's brilliant because you can have really an, an amazing panel of very different expertise uh, from very different localities so with different projects. Um, it's, it's a very incredible resource um, as well. But then, like, um, one thing that was kind of always in my mind was um, how can we actually bring more money into the art world? Because bottom line, it is about that, right? The artist needs money to produce, institution needs money to do exhibitions, and so on and so forth. So it's always at the, in the middle, and we're always struggling for this in the arts. Uh, it's always difficult. And, um, and I think that's my really, that 
I don't know why I was bored, I think, to have this mission. I, I'm, I, I'm thinking like the, really the digital space has to help with this. Um, in Hong Kong, I was telling you I was doing fundraising, and I think I got every single idea possible in three years to do it in the physical world, and it's really, really tough. Uh, the digital has to help. And I always had this in mind um, since I started the, the social network because I thought going to the curators will be able to bring the artists in and the institutions and we can create that ecosystem um, that can you know, really eventually help in getting money for, for, for them. And I fold into that thing um, you know, almost two years ago now. Uh, it was actually Vil sending me an article telling me you have to look at this, you know. And um, I was extremely skeptical as any art world person. <laughs> and, uh, and then I really looked at it and I was like, okay, that's, if it, it, it's, it's a tool, right? And if you look at it in a specific point of view, it can be brilliant. And how do we, how do we approach the NFT space and, and the, the tool as an NFT? So very first, for the one who do not know what's an NFT, very simply, it's a certificate of ownership of something, of a digital asset. So an MP3, a JPEG, a PDF, all of a sudden, you can actually own it. That's, that is what it is, basically. It's not, it's not the artwork, the NFT is not the artwork, it's a contract. The artwork remains in the JPEG or the MP4. Um, but all of a sudden, if you think like this, it means that you can own art online. And this is our approach. So the curators that has been in the network, selected, working with institutions and so on, are bringing the, you know, selecting the artist and organizing show can actually um, create like digital art editions collections. So you basically kind of remove the whole logistics of doing art editions. And I can tell you that because at Underdog, that's what we are doing. It's very complex. You need money, you need, uh, you need people to roll, you need people to follow production. Uh, it's a nightmare, and not every institution, artist, curators can actually do it. NFT removes all of this. So yes, you do not have the signature and the number of the artist on the image, but you have it in the blockchain. It's registered there. You know who is the artist behind, it's, it's there. Okay? So, they do, they do uh, editions, and what we are doing, because what's interesting for us is to talk to people who love the work of the artist and, and visit institutions and so on, um, we are proposing people to print, okay? So they can still get something tangible. It's not just having a JPEG in a crypto wallet. And the idea is you can have it you know, in, in the museums, and then you have the collections where on the collections you obviously have like all the work of the curators, you have the text, you have you know, explanation on each of the work and so on. And for the people visiting, that's what I was telling you, they can you know, uh, see the different collections we are doing on the platform. Um, in the middle you have a, a, a museum of car and, and uh, you don't see the car, it's the art pool logo in, in the middle. But in the Portugal, uh, Caramulo Museum on the left is an artistic residency in Turkey. On the right, it's a work of an artist. So here it wasn't linked to a physical project, Ana Mosqueda, um, but it was curated by an Argentinian uh, curator. We let people pay by card as well, so you don't need to understand crypto, you don't need to have crypto, uh, but you can still you know, support and, 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 and buy artworks, and then eventually you can receive it and put it in your place. But to finish about the depth thing, and as, you know, this is, this is a tough adventure. It's, I think it's the hardest work I could have ever imagined. Um, and I think like personally, the depths I put into things when I do them, because I don't know if you've seen the, the, the past is really something super important for me to do things well, to really put like, um, you know, to understand the different visions and so on. And when you create a startup, sometimes you cannot go into depth. Um, because it's about, you know, time, uh, it's about reaction, it's about iteration, trying out, and being, going into depth, you're always like after the, the last train, you know? So it's, for me, it's kind of an inter internal conflict, um, because I really love to do things well, but I also need to, you know, you need to be able to test things, 
uh, when you create a platform like this, you can't be, you know, sometimes you, you have like just the facade of things, which, for example, the landing page we are doing, not the blockchain, because the blockchain, you obviously need to go in depth and what you're doing is, is you know, have to, have to be pushed. But for example, the landing page, you need to start and try things because you don't know how people react to it. And for me, I would like the landing page to be really perfect, but the thing, it's never perfect. Um, so it's, it's really oscillating between, you know, and I think I found the depth into the curators we talk to, the artists we talk to, the, the feedback of people. Uh, you know, I, I, I still um, curate at the dogs. We are still like doing a festival. So I have feedback of people. This, these are things that, you know, are really fulfilling. And then you need to adjust on, on, on the startup thing. It's, um, it's a tough pass, not only because of that, uh, I think it's not said enough. It's uh, it's exhausting. It's it's a lot of energy, but it's also um, you know really something like I think when you really um, believe in something, um, there's people. It's money. Others, it's others. For me, it's something else. I really think we can find a way to create new digital revenues for for the art ecosystem. Um, and I wake up every day for this. I believe in this. We'll see if you know uh, we become the platform. Uh, but even if not, I think like if we are able to, you know, help institutions and so on. At least I know that the way we have done it is has been done in depth. Like at least it was very honest. So that's it. I think. Thank you for being here, it's a honor for me. And I will try to make your time uh, valued, because I know it's valuable. <laughs> now, we're not getting any younger with such a long introduction, and I've decided to bring another aspect of depth into the conversation. The dictionary has got several meanings for the word depth. One of them applies to color. You talk about the depth of color, don't you? Which are the deep colors? Now, depth usually means that a color is either dark or rich. We will discuss that, because even the word rich can mean many things. <laughs> dark is relatively consensual. Rich can mean many things. So. I've got some very interesting physical facts from science. Uh, you, you probably know that the world is colorblind. You're aware of that. Color does not exist outside of the human experience or the animal experience, I must say. So essentially, color is just the way our bodies, and only one part of our bodies, um, react to vibrations. Light is a wavelength. It's a frequency. It's similar to sound, it's similar to heat, temperature, color, sound, they're the same thing. Did you know that? Actually, physical matter, up to a great, 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 great point, it's also frequency, it's also vibration. Not only, but mainly. So we could claim that wavelengths exist, but color does not exist outside of the animal experience. We see colors, other animals see colors, some of them, but the world is colorless. The world is colorblind. So we're going to start with a graphic. I love charts. <laughs> How tiny do you think this is? And how huge do you think that is? I'm going to tell you. So, all the frequencies that have been measured so far, all the wavelengths, as the name says, there's a wave. Up and down, up and down, up and down, vibration. The length of the wave will determine the type of ray. Let's start. The smallest, the smallest one, we have it there, gamma rays one billionth of a millimeter. 
look at a millimeter on the ruler, divide it by a billion. <laughs> ah, and if the light is pulsating, one billion, super fast. If the light is pulsating at that speed, you've got gamma rays. Now get ready for the big shock. You thought one billionth was impressive, it's not. It's actually very disappointing. <laughs> Radio waves can go up to 10 kilometers. Yes, the wave is as long as 10 kilometers between the two valleys of the wave. Huh? Incredible. Now, human, the human eye only sees a tiny fraction of these frequencies. This tiny, tiny, tiny section, everything else is invisible to the human eye. This tiny fraction represents the spectrum. I'll give you some numbers. <laughs> We can see from 0 0.00038 millimeters up to 0 0.00075 millimeters. And because of that neglectable detail, empires have been created and lost. Hundreds of millions of people had been killed in wars, either religious or economical. Love stories have started and fizzled out because of color. Now, I refuse to talk about fake colors. Today, we'll only talk about colors with depth. That's the subject. Fake colors such as this one. Pink. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the most important pink in the history of painting, it's called Dutch pink. It's actually yellow. So pink cannot be relied upon. I refuse to talk about pink. I refuse to talk about emerald green. It was an insecticide. It killed thousands of people. Emerald green was probably the poison that killed Napoleon in exile because his room was painted that color. So many Victorians died. There was this big trend, like, like many things in London. When it starts, you can't stop it, for the good and for the bad. Now, Emerald green was the latest craze in chemistry. They created the bright green pigment. I'll refuse to talk about these uh, murderous colors like <laughs> emerald green. Emerald green was arsenic. And arsenic with humidity releases a toxic fume that killed Napoleon, apparently. Let's not, oh, oh yes, yes. And the ladies were wearing it. Incredible, huh? So, I refuse to talk about emerald green. What about yellow? A foul color that I shall not mention today. The most important yellow in history was Indian yellow. It's the urine of cows that are fed with mango leaves. We shall not talk about yellow. What about mummy brown? Yes, you heard me right. Brown. Brown, that despicable color that used to be ground from real mummies. Again, the Brits, when they went, when they went to Egypt, they thought it was a great idea to grind mummies and make paint. Thousands and thousands of paintings in art museums actually have the remains of human bodies. We shall not talk about brown. This is the paint. <laughs> human bodies turned into mummy brown, a very popular color. Um, 
Royard Kipling, he, he wrote the Jungle Book, you remember. So, he used to spend uh, summers in Britain with his uncle, I believe, Sir Edward uh, Byrne Jones, a famous painter. And Kipling recalls that when he was a child, they found a tube of mummy brown, well, they found, uh, I think it was like to scare him, <laughs> the little child, you know, spending, spending holidays with uncle, eccentric uncle, eccentric artist. So they found a tube of mummy brown, and they've decided, uh, this is a painting by Edward uh, Byrne Jones, a pre-Raphaelite artist, very important artist. They've decided to bury it. They've decided to bury the tube of Mummy Brown with proper dignified funeral in the garden because it probably was made out of the remnants of pharaohs. We shall not talk about brown. Another color that I'll refuse to mention, I will not even tell you the name, <laughs> because it has been accused of being a non-color. How deceiving of a color to be a non-color. This treachery, this... this uh, Essentially, it's used around the eyes of the Taliban's. They look so pretty, like young girls. So the Taliban's use makeup to show that they're protected by Allah. Coal comes from a metal called antimony. It also protects the eyes from conjunctivitis and other diseases. Now, essentially, <laughs> I find it amusing that coal which is a product of distillation, gave rise to the name alcohol, which is the most banned product in Islam. So, <laughs> they are using alcohol to show that they were chosen by God. Pretty girl, Taliban. Next. <laughs> that color that I refuse to mention, because it's a non-color, okay, I'll tell you. The fake name is black. Um, the Kama Sutra also suggests that you make a black conconction, it's a, it's a love poison made with monkey excrements, and you should rub it on the body of the maid that you love so, so that she doesn't marry anyone else. Now, I would say that works for sure. <laughs> we shall not talk about black today. What about the fake black? Even worse. Also a non-color. Graphite. Gray. Gray. Do you know any color that has least personality? <laughs> gray can be any, anything and nothing. We will not talk about gray. And worse than gray. Worse than gray, it's fake gray. Silver. Shocking. It's not even gray. So graphite. Graphite was so expensive because the Brits would only allow the graphite mines, the only mines in the world that were known at that time, the Brits would only allow the mines to be opened for seven weeks a year to keep the prices extremely high. Quantity was low, the price was extreme. Now, graphite, the fake gray. Uh, you know, artists didn't have pencils until at least the 16th century, and especially, it's, it's really during the 18th century that pencils become uh, current. Artists never drew with pencils until that period in history. They used to draw with metal point, silver, etc., chalk, colored clays, uh, you name it, charcoal, but not with pencils. Graphite pencils make their real entrance in the 18th century. But even before, there are some little examples. Now, it was not artist art materials that made graphite expensive. It was its lubricating qualities. Apparently, if you rub the tube of a cannon with graphite and you fire it, the bullet, or whatever you call that thing, pops much further because it lubricates all right? 
It was so expensive that miners used to steal it and put it in their underwear or other places. So as a result, by law, all miners had to strip naked every time they would left the mine and they would be examined to make sure they were not hiding little nuggets. This was the price of graphite. I've got um, an interesting story to tell you as well. Oh yes, I can't remember which century, but stealing graphite was so, it was worse than murder that parliament attached um, one year, one year forced labor if you were caught with stolen graphite. One year, sent to Siberia probably, you know, something like that. <laughs> okay, we shall not talk about gray. What about murderers, poisonous white, clinical white, another non-color, another fake color. I always find it amusing when people say it's not a color. It's a bit ridiculous because if you ask what color is your sheet of paper, you never reply, it's not a color. <laughs> you say it's white. So of course that for artists, black, white and gray are colors. What we should say perhaps, let's be a bit more technical. We should never say they're not colors because that's a bit silly. What we can say is that it's not a pure frequency of the spectrum. That is true, but it's definitely a color. Psychologically, it's a color. In terms of human experience, it's a color. It's just not a pure frequency. But then, who is pure nowadays? Doesn't matter. <laughs> don't ask. Next. Let, don't answer, don't ask. Because <laughs> I answer everything. Lead white. Let's not talk about this. Horrid, horrid, amazing pigment. It's actually the best pigment ever invented in the history of mankind for oil painting. It's the only pigment that makes oil paintings not crack. So technically, it was a disaster when contemporary artists started using things like titanium white, or even worse, much worse, zinc white. That's why when you look at contemporary art, it's in a much, much, much state of preservation, much worse state of preservation than paintings that are 800 years old. Technically, a dip. Uh, disaster not to use lead white, but we will not talk about lead white because it used to kill people. Look at that. Geishas, in order to look stunning, and they did, they used to powder their faces with lead, and they used to paint their lipstick, their, their lips, they used to paint them with mercury, vermilion. They would all die when they were like 30 years old. People thought it was a curse. But much more ridiculous was Europe, as always. <laughs> we are barbarians in disguise. I, I really believe in this. I have no doubts, actually. So the European culture, um, we are just very good at covering things with a thin, thin, thin sheet of veneered uh, glitter. But the third is still there. <laughs> <laughs> now, Elizabeth I, the virgin queen, the pure queen, the immaculate queen, she had to be whiter than white lead. Of course, she painted her face with the poisonous chemical. Do you know that before you die of lead poisoning, you go a little bit eccentric? You go a little bit cuckoo. <laughs> that explains a lot. Now, <laughs> we will not talk about white. Also because white betrays you when it's applied Essentially, white lead is the best pigment in history for oil painting. It's one of the worst in history for aqueous types of paints, like watercolor, gouache, acrylics, cannot have lead white. Because lead white, if it's not protected 
by a layer of linseed oil or some varnish or something, it turns black. And this is what happens to these amazing paintings in China. They're 1,400 years ago. And the white, not white, but the pink, the treacherous color as well. The pink color, the flesh of Buddha turned black. So deceiving non-colors like white will not be the subject of today's talk. Let's start with the first color that has depth. Only two colors have depth today, because I say so. <laughs> oh, I forgot to ask you one thing, actually. I need your expertise. I need your expertise because is he wearing yellow or is it Dutch pink? <laughs> Let's begin with a tale. Like every good story, you have usually a city. Far away is better. And someone that falls in love. We are starting, I wouldn't even dare to mention the name of this color because it's so sacred. Purple. Purple was the most expensive color of the ancient world. At multiple periods in time in history, only Roman emperors could wear purple. Death penalty for everybody else. You're wearing purple. Chop your head off. Oh my goodness me, you too? Chop your head off? <laughs> hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. No purple? No? Okay. No. Purple. It was so expensive that a worker, an average Roman worker, would need one year's wages to dye one single t-shirt. One year's salary for one t-shirt. You heard me right. Roman emperors, they were purple. Caesar had the brilliant idea. But behind every great man, they usually say, what was that film that said, um, the man is the head of the family, but the wife is the neck, and the neck can turn the head in any direction she wants. <laughs> this was an amazing quote, because that's exactly what happened. Caesar went to Egypt, invited by the most fascinating woman of the ancient world, Cleopatra. She was a seductive, powerful, intelligent woman. She knew what she was doing. Apparently, she was also very, very wise in the arts of magic. She might have put a spell together with the color purple. And what happened? Like I was telling you, purple was the most expensive color of the ancient world. When Caesar arrives to Egypt, Cleopatra ordained something to happen, which I will tell you in a second. This is the color. There are multiple shades of Tyrian purple. Tyrian purple was made in Phoenicia. It was a very well-kept secret. Even Pliny and all those historians, uh, they got it totally wrong when they tried to describe how to make purple because they didn't know the formula. I think they made it up, but they described how it was made. We knew that it came from a shellfish, the murex. To dye one imperial toga for Caesar or Nero or one of those lovely guys, you needed, a, essentially you needed to kill about 10,000 murexes. 10,000 for one toga. <sighs> yes. Uh, even nowadays in Lebanon, you have huge hills that are actually all the dead bodies of the shell uh, murexes that were used. The smell was foul. 
So they had to, they had to do the dyeing process way outside the cities and always in a place where the predominant winds would send away the fumes because it was foul. Now, Cleopatra, there she is. And like I was telling you, all good stories start far away and with love. Caesar arrives to Egypt. Cleopatra ordains the whole of the Egyptian fleet. All the sails of the ships were dyed purple. This magnificent display of wealth, this magnificent display of economic power, even Caesar himself had never seen anything like that in Rome. Forget it, only Egypt had such an economic might. Of course, he fell in love. The wallet matters a lot. <laughs> Maybe that was his magic. Maybe that was the magic. Did you know that ancient languages did not have a word for blue? Apart from Egyptian. There are even some theories that I find fascinating that ancient peoples could not see blue. It's, it, there's a lot of debate amongst the scientific community. We don't know yet if blue is a new gene that emerged in humanity, a gene that propagates very easily. Actually, so easily that it's very rare to find someone that is colorblind to blue. You can be colorblind to red, to green, to multiple colors, browns, forget it. Blue, extremely rare. So it's a predominant gene, the ability to see blue. According to this theory, ancient peoples could not see blue. You don't have the word blue in most of the ancient languages, apart from Egypt. But again, Egypt was the only country in the world that was producing a blue pigment. Could be cultural as well. But the sky is blue everywhere, and yet you didn't have the word for blue. Homer, Homer in the Odyssey, when he describes the, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the bluest of blues, he says it's the color of red wine. The waves were like wine. Now, we don't know if that meant the color or if that meant the storm, because when you pour wine, the wine bubbles inside the glass. So maybe it was the poetic way for Homer to describe a storm. A beautiful way, I must say. But we shall not talk about red, another horrible color. Back to blue. You have the hieroglyphs. You have all the words. Most of the world's greatest art was anonymous. If you look at 99.9% .9 of the whole history of art, it was made by anonymous artists. Until very recently, it was actually frowned upon to sign your name on a piece of art, because that was vanity. Don't forget that different civilizations have different values. The medieval monk that made those incredible scrolls would not sign the name because it was for the glory of God, not to his own glory. It's in cultures where individualism is rampant that artists sign their work. That started roughly in Renaissance Italy. It's, it's more of a Western thing. And then it became predominant more and more and more so, and nowadays it's global. But essentially, it's a very, very modern invention. 500 years in the history of art is nothing. Art is at least 70,000 years old. 500 years is nothing. It's a glitch. It's a little mistake. It's an error. It's a bit that went off on a CD. So all these incredible stained glass blues that you see in cathedrals like Chartres, for example, they were created by anonymous artists. Now, these artists were a little bit of rogues because glaziers, they would run from city to city, according to which was the latest cathedral being built. They would go from place to place and they would keep secrets. 
the furnaces would light up and they would melt sand. They would add to the sand secret ingredients to create the most dazzling colors. They were a bit of magicians, alchemists. There was a lot of deceit as well. Sometimes the color was forged. We'll talk about that some other day. But essentially, the blue that you see in Chartres is so special when you see it live that a new myth emerged, that the formula had been lost. That is not true, by the way. Scientists know exactly how to replicate this blue. But this shows how colors can have this magic power over the spectator. They, they are the source of myths. They are the source of stories. And now we go back to Britain, notoriously. <laughs> the Britons, when Caesar went to, to the UK, it wasn't the UK, the Isles, to conquer those so-called barbarians. Caesar was very bemused, amused, surprised, and perhaps a little bit shocked when he faced these fierceless tribes that used to fight bare naked, but their whole bodies were painted blue. It was a matriarchal society, so each woman could have up to 10 husbands. And what, or 12. No, you'll, you'll lose count after a certain number. So, when Caesar was fighting this blue man, there was actually this queen, you might know her. She killed, ah, so Boudica. She was the queen of these Britons and she killed almost 100,000 Romans and uh, traitors that were supporting the Romans, you know. They all went. Uh, it was such a massacre that Nero considered withdrawing all the Roman army, the whole of it, out of Britain. But essentially, these men afterwards, they were defeated and then uh, the Romans carried on. But this is quite an amazing, an amazing uh, feat. What's incredible about this color is that it, it's locally sourced. It grows everywhere in Britain. It's called wood. And wood, if you change a word or two, becomes weed. Because it, this plant used to grow so abundantly, so invasively, <laughs> so terrifyingly, Domineering that the word weed comes from that. It just spreads. W O A D, woad. Now, woad creates indigo. And indigo is the shade of blue that was forbidden for several centuries to come from India. When indigo started being fashionable in Europe because of people such as this, the Puritans. I'll explain later. Indigo is blue. You don't want blue if you're a Puritan. Let's talk about purity in a second. Let's begin with indigo. Indigo started arriving from India. And it was so powerful that they had to find a way to stop the, the import of indigo. Woods used to be the source of blue. Indigo had to be stopped. So the middle classes in Europe, what did they do? They created false laws. In Britain, they pretended that the indigo from India was poisonous. It, it's not. In order to protect the local trade. And I've got some names here. I'm almost ending my speech. I've got some... So for example, in 1609, France still had the death penalty if you were caught wearing real indigo. It had to be wood from France. <laughs> In Britain, it was still banned up to 1660 under the false claims that it was poisonous, the indigo from India. It's not. But 
why would the Puritans suddenly support the trade of indigo? They realized that the Indian indigo was much superior to the European, was much stronger, and in order to dye your fabrics black at that period, you would need to use indigo as well because there was no black dye that was dark enough to look really black. So let's put it this way. The Puritans are very pure, very good people, but they would do anything, and I mean anything, to have their black clothes even blacker and their white fabrics even whiter, even murder. <laughs> so indigo was finally approved uh, all across Europe. For the indigo to grab to the fabric, you had to pee on it, of course. <laughs> you needed stale urine, of course. So somebody discovered, I don't know why, just two minutes, somebody discovered that the best urine in the whole of the United Kingdom came from Newcastle. <laughs> so Newcastle peed for England. And buckets and buckets of urine would be sent to London. I don't know why, but Londoners didn't have high quality urine. <laughs> Had to come from Newcastle. It's quite amazing. <laughs> what were they drinking? Beer, of course. <laughs> Finally, I'm about to conclude Mayan blue. It's also a type of indigo, but surprisingly, it doesn't fade. Indigo fades very quickly. But Mayan blue stayed vibrant for more than 500 years. Chemists have discovered why. If you mix indigo with a special clay, the particles of indigo are trapped inside the particles of clay, and that prevents oxidation. That makes the pigment permanent. So Mayan blue. And finally, to conclude, the last color, lapis lazuli. I always tell you this story those who attend my lessons, they will hear it for the 20th time. These are the incredible mines of lapis lazuli in Afghanistan. And yes, they are hand-picked. And yes, they are carried like this by people that are paid a pittance. These workers, they have nothing else to survive. And according to political problems in the region, they might be in or out of work. If the Taliban take that region, rah, and then it changes, if a new commander comes back, then they were... Big confusion, big mess. And in the ancient world, there was only one source of lapis lazuli. Lapis was the only real pigment in the ancient world that would not fade. Indigo fades. All the other blues, they turn green or black when they're used in oil paint, but lapis stays. So if you look at a piece of Afghan lapis lazuli, the highest grade, grade one, top quality, what do you see in there? You see the sky. You see the blue of the sky, you see yellow stars, and you see white clouds. Now, Imagine you are in the 15th century. You believe that everything that looks alike comes from the same principle. It's one of the principles of alchemy. If it looks like heaven, it's because it came from heaven. So to the medieval European minds, lapis lazuli was celestial substance that condensed and fell into the earth. It came from heaven. Because it came from heaven, it was used to paint the most sacred objects. In the case of Persia, this is the best lapis I've ever seen in my life, are Persian manuscripts, specifically from the 17th century. I don't know what happened, but in the 17th century, the blue is outstanding. No photo can do justice to the originals. And now the last image. We are looking at the Descent of the Cross by van der Weyden. And this painting was made for the Archers Guild in Flanders. This is the Flemish period, 600 years ago. Now, the Archers Guild, look at this. Pay attention now, this is amazing. 
Christ himself is shaped like a bow. You're ready to shoot an arrow through that shape. As Christ, because it's for the Archer's Guild, it makes sense. As Christ is brought down from the cross, dead, his mother, the Virgin Mary, she faints like if she was dead herself. Her body echoes the same shape of the dead son. This is like echo, 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 echo. Same shape, same meaning. Notice how she's approaching death at the bottom. There is a skull. She's falling towards death herself. And the blue, the most precious color of the Middle Ages, was used to represent the mantle of the Virgin. All these colors, they have meanings. Classical art was by far the most conceptually rich type of art ever made. In terms of concepts and the layers of understanding, it's unbeatable. Again, different societies have different interests. In this period, they were perhaps not so much interested in representing the moment of the society, but they were more interested in representing eternal truths. So what you see in a lot of the symbology of color, and just to conclude now, is that colors do not exist. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.